बुद्धम शरणम गच्छा ตัลลังเมจูเบนจีชามีเปมุลลาตูจินพุงบะกุลลาตูจินมาตูเมยุมลาชานเซโลอมตะเรตุตะเรตุเรโซฮาอมตะเรตุตะเรตุเรโซ
that having found such a precious human life with leisure and endowment, if I do not make my mind habituated with the virtuous practices, there cannot be anything more deceiving than this, and there cannot be more stupid than this. So therefore, it is important to use this opportunity with amazing human intelligence. And this will naturally lead to the question, how to do Dharma practice? And it is said that at the time of the Buddha, a celestial being or a deva asked four questions to the Buddha. The first question was, by what one will know the Dharma? Second was, by what means one can stop the negative deeds? Third question was, by what means one will give away the meaninglessness? And the fourth one was, by what means one can actualize the state beyond suffering or nirvana? So to this, the Buddha answered by saying that by listening, one will know the Dharma. By listening, one can stop the negative deeds. By listening, one can stop meaningless activities. And by listening, one will transcend suffering. So this answer, four answers to the four questions is basically talking about the importance of the three trainings, morality, concentration, and wisdom. By listening, one will know the Dharma, means just by listening to the teaching is of great benefit. Because just by listening to the teaching, even if you are unable to know the depth of the teaching, but just by listening to it, you will get some idea, some insight. So it's very, very important. And then second important thing is by listening, gradually you will understand the meaning and stop many negative deeds. Because the many negative deeds that we do are because of our lack of knowledge, because of our ignorance. So these first two lines is talking about practice of morality. So it is by practice of morality or ethical discipline that you will be able to stop the negative deeds. So mark this point by, by practicing or, or adopting the moral deeds that you can stop the negative deeds, not just by listening. Listening and understanding what to practice and then practicing them and then refraining from the negative deeds. Third, by listening, one can stop meaningless activities means that we end up doing many meaningless activities because it is this pursuit to meaningless activities that we get distracted, especially in today's world. world. I think I mentioned this earlier many times that we lead really a totally, totally distracted life. There's no concentration. And I also cited this quotation, not from Buddhism, but also some, from some ancient Greek where it is said that concentration is the source of success, both in war and in peace. You see, and concentration is really like the laser beam, not just a laser beam, but a laser beam where all the scattered rays of the light are brought together. And it is by bringing all the beams of the laser light together that it gets the power and energy to cut through the steel. If you let the, you know, the rays or the beams scattered, then individually they don't have that strength and capacity to cut through steel, but if you bring together, or concentrate the rays and the beams together, you can cut through, the, the laser beams can cut through the steel. So similarly, <coughs> a mind concentrated can achieve anything. A distracted mind will not achieve anything. Today, in the modern world, there's so much distraction. Distraction, especially in the name of multitasking. 
<laughs> you're able to do so many things, then people actually, you know, applaud it, saying that, oh, he's very good in doing this, doing that, you know. And then you let your monkey mind run wild. So you seem to be achieving a little bit here and there, but you are really not achieving the things that you must achieve. You see? So the problem is where we should concentrate, we are not concentrating. Areas where we should not be focusing on concentrating, we are concentrating. That's the problem in our life also. Too much focus to the external material world. To, to weapons, things like that. And focus within oneself, it is not there. That's the problem. So therefore it is by, by listening to the Dharma and understanding its teaching that you will be able to stop many of these useless activities. We can, we can start doing this right from today or from tomorrow. You can start doing this. Check yourself. Not just reading the text, but check. Now since you've heard this teaching, now you check with your life in what areas you are, you are focusing and how much time you are spending in meaningless pursuits. And I, earlier I told you this story of a, a Tibetan teacher who had asked his student, are you, are you studying, are you practicing? Then he said, yes, I, I do. Then the teacher scolded him by saying, don't tell lie because I see you getting distracted the whole day and sleeping the whole night. So where do you get the time to practice? This is absolutely true. And for us as ordinary human beings, we spend much of the time in the pursuit of getting food. We pay so much attention to food and clothing and housing, and especially to the food, okay? So it is in the pursuit of these material things that you spend a lot of time, you know, and in between, of course, you do many, many meaningless things. And what, what you know, which of this is meaningless? As and you grow older and older, you will know. I have started knowing a little bit. And I've stopped therefore reading many meaningless books now. Because there's not much time to do good things, right? I've over the years accumulated so many books, so many books. And right from the beginning, I'm not so interested in reading fictional books. But I'm interested in reading the real, you know, life stories real thing that happened. I used to read those books. And I especially is more interested in books on education or science and health and those kind of things. I'm not a great, you know, voracious reader, but I have that interest in that. But, but over the year, you know, you also, because these days, you know, for marketing, there's so many books in the market with very catchy and attractive titles, you know. And then, then you, you expect and thinking that, yes, there is the solution in this book and you end up buying it. And so I, I do those things. So I've, I've over the you know, years accumulated so many books. So my, my, my room is actually like a library, you see. Now I've started like the CDs, the DVDs, you know, you know, the books, you know. So, so these days I'm, I'm as much as possible trying to <laughs> send them away. <laughs> by donating it to some bookshops or some other, you know, uh, places. So you need to start doing that cleaning up. Most of you are much younger than me. So if you start right from now, you know, get those things which you, which you really need and not, not many things, your life will also be simpler, easier, and you will actually learn much better than paying attention to so many things. So therefore the, the third line is saying that achieve concentration. Now, when we talk about achieving concentration, I have said earlier, achieving concentration is not just being able to focus on one object. Even the practice of concentration or mindness, mindfulness can be used in wrong areas. Mindful <laughs> practice is taught in US Army these days. Concentration is also taught. So how, how, how can like shoot the enemy with full concentration, <laughs> with full mindfulness. So kind of meditation is needed there also. 
So therefore, here when we do talk about the, the Buddhist meditation, mindfulness, concentration, we are primarily talking about letting one's mind get habituated with these positive virtuous practices and get habituated with concentrating on what is really important. So concentration is not just concent being able to concentrate on one object, but primarily at the end of the day, to be able to concentrate in helping others. In helping others and in accumulating the virtuous practices. There you need concentration. I have earlier, you know, told this by citing quotation from uh, Tsongkhapa's Great Stages of the Path, where Tsongkhapa said, your mind is controlled by, you are controlled by your mind. Your mind is predominantly controlled by negative emotions. Therefore, you are experiencing suffering. Therefore, now you make your mind habituated with good things. There's the purpose of meditation. Okay, meditation is, when we talk about concentration meditation, it's not like you remain as if you are stupefied, you know, as somebody hit a hammer on your head, you know, nothing, you know, reflecting, nothing thinking, just sitting there, you know. <laughs> there's, 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 there is not, not meditation, that is not concentration. Concentration means concentrating on virtuous practices and especially concentrating on helping others. So this clearly spells out that meditation concentration is not sitting on a seat all the time. It means when you do things helping others, concentrate with full heart, with full delight, help them. That is concentration and good concentration. And then the fourth line says that it is through listening and hearing that you can transcend suffering or you can actualize nirvana. That means through hearing, you will be able to, you know, first you hear and then you think, then you meditate and then you develop this wisdom through, th through hearing, wisdom through thinking and wisdom through meditation. So therefore you are able to develop this wisdom which can fight against the ignorance, which is the root of samsara, root of suffering. And as and when you remove and eradicate that root of suffering, then of course you actualize nirvana or liberation from suffering. So here you can very clearly see how to do dharma practice. So therefore we should, right at the outset of this session, feel happy that we are able to use this time to you know, listen to such a precious teaching by Nagarjuna, right? And the purpose of listening is, as I mentioned many times earlier, not to just just know the word, know the meaning, and then able to share it to others, you know, oneself not practicing at all, not, not just that. Of course, we cannot become enlightened in one day, but at least we should identify the target. That the target is oneself must, as much as possible, become compassionate, change one's mind, become better. Then you will be naturally equipped to help others. So that, that primary purpose and motivation should be there in all of our, our practices. So today we are reading the fourth verse, the fourth verse, which says, you should bring to mind the six things of six recollections. Sometimes we call it six things to remember, six recollections. That is the enlightened one, which means you remember Buddha, his teaching, remember Dharma. The noble assembly means remember the Sangha and then re remember generosity or giving. And then fifth is remember morality. And the sixth is the gods or the celestial beings. The heap of qualities of each of these six recollection was well taught by the, by the Buddha. That means by, by remembering these six, you know, there will be a lot of benefits. And these are clearly taught by the Buddha. So the first one is taking refuge to Buddha Dharma and Sangha, Buddham Saranam Gachami, which we already recited. Because to, to become a to become a Buddhist, you know, there are in Buddhism we talk about three gateways, three doors, entrances. Just as without entering the door, you cannot go into the house. 
So similarly, there are three entrances you know, in the Buddhist practice, three levels of entrances. In order to become a Buddhist, you need to enter the door of taking refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. That's not easy. In order to take refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, you really need to know at least quite well why should one take refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, and who these three guys are. <laughs> and why three, not more. So to simplify this point, we should know that when in Buddhism, when we talk about taking refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, we are not, you know, making something peculiar, you know, or unique, which is not, you know, there in the human nature. It is in fact in the human nature to take refuge because human beings, whoever we are, we do not have the capacity to solve all the problems by ourselves. So when you are unable to solve your problem, you, you are compelled to take refuge to someone, not only human beings, but also to other like natural forces. In, in many other religious traditions, there is this practice of worshiping the sun, worshiping the moon, worshiping the trees. All this came about because there are many calamities and problems, difficulties, people unable to solve it. And then people thought there must be God reciting the tree, God reciting the sun. So they started taking refuge or even otherwise, since so much energy, you know, heat comes from the sun, gives so much, you know, uh, energy. So therefore we take refuge to all those sources that is there. So clearly, you know, we have this uh, in our nature to take refuge. And I, I have been jokingly telling people that uh, in the midday, 12 o'clock, you take refuge in your lunch when you're hungry. And uh, if you just sit there without, you know, taking food, you will starve. So naturally, you will, you take refuge to the, to the lunch. And if it is raining outside or it's very hot outside, then you take refuge in the umbrella. Long, long ago, men lived in the cave. They take refuge in the cave to protect themselves from ferocious wild animals. So it is in the human nature. Now, the question here is, yes, that is true. I accept human beings are compelled to take you know, refuge in many things, but why we take refuge? Why we take refuge to the cave? Easy. Why we take refuge to umbrella when it's raining? Easy, I understood all this. But why we take refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha? There's the point. And who these three guys are, as I said. Okay? <laughs> so, so now, you know, you need to know the fact that whenever we have a problem, then we take refuge. Okay? In Tibetan, we have a, even a it's not a joke, but in, in Tibet, we have a saying that Thang Demun Dudulu Allah Thala. So that means when you are you are traveling in a very you know uh, smooth road or plane, then you will sing beautiful songs. You don't take refuge. You, you, you never. You, there's no need for you to you know think about taking refuge to anybody because the the road is smooth and uh, you know there is no problem. So you start singing. You see, that's that's the meaning. But when you cross a cliff or a dangerous place, then you remember the God and the Guru Pema Sambhava and Buddha and things like that, right? So, so therefore, when we talk about taking refuge to the Buddha Dharma, Dharma Sangha, we need to know what is our problem. The problem is, you know, many of the temporary problems can be solved by other people or from the nature, by food and things like that. But there are many other problems which this, you know, external, you know, material things can solve. So now here in this case, when we say I take refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha, you are talking about a major problem, major difficulty. And that problem is being stuck in the samsara, being stuck in the cycle of existence under the bondage of this psychophysical aggregate, okay? Fortunately, unfortunately, we, we don't give much thought about this bondage of the psychophysical aggregate, but if you think carefully, then you will realize, you know, we are prone to sickness, we are prone to separation from our dear and near ones, and then we, you know, so many problems, countless problems are there. And all these countless problems are there because, because the body, the psychophysical aggregate that you, you got itself is in the nature that it is 
fragile. On top of the fact that the psychophysical aggregate is fragile, but you also don't know how to handle it carefully, how to nurture it. So there's a kind of double problem, you see. So therefore, in order to get out of this cycle of existence, okay, you need to take refuge. So the main problem of your having stuck in the samsara is ignorance and negative emotions. And the way to cut asunder ignorance and negative emotions is taught by the Buddha, the enlightened beings. Not everybody knows about it. Some may have some sense, but they do not know. Sometimes people ask me this very funny question. Why, 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 we, why do, we, do we have to study the teaching of the Buddha or any other great teacher? Why don't you find your path by yourself? This, this is a question people very often ask. Then I tell them, yeah, if you are very intelligent, maybe you can find it. But it's quite difficult. It will be quite difficult. I'll give you an example. For example, if you want to fly to America, okay, New York or wherever, and then if you say, oh, I'm going to go to New York without consulting anybody, the travel agent, the guide or road mayor, whatever, you know, without any, how, how will you go? You have no sense of direction. How will you go? You will not be able to even ask the pertinent questions. <laughs> so it's impossible. Impossible, right? And if you, if you just, just, you know, uh, Lam tham tham lam tham tham ji tham tham There's this funny, you know, word, Tibetan word, which says, if you choose a path which is like dark and unclear, you will also get a fruit which is dark and unclear, you know. Or if you go by a path which is full of doubt, the fruit will also be full of doubt. You know, there's, there, there will be no clear cut achievement. So therefore, and I had mentioned this earlier, that even in this life, there are many things that we, we learn from other people, which we can actually see with our eye, like carpentry. There also we need somebody to teach you, computer or things like which we can see. Now, when we talk about engaging in spiritual practice, we are talking about internal experiences, which you cannot see with your eye. And especially, you know, when, when you talk about achieving nirvana, enlightenment and benefits in the future lives, we really have no clue, no much idea. So unless you depend on someone, somebody, who has that knowledge, who has that qualification, and in fact, complete knowledge, we cannot, you know, get that needed help. So therefore, we take refuge in somebody who is completely enlightened, the Buddha. And Dharma means what he has taught, and Sangha means those who follow that path, really speaking. So these three. So the question is, why just three? Make it more so that we feel more supported. Maybe like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, not more than three, or you should just simplify it, make it just one, just Buddha enough. Why three? So this is also, many of you I'm sure you know, but for the sake of others who have not heard, I'm explaining this again and again. So just as when we physically get ill, we need many things, but we primarily need three, three things. We need a good doctor, physician, who will properly diagnose your you know, illness. And that is not enough. You need actual medicine, which actually heals your illness. And even if you have the medicine and good doctor, but nobody supporting you, because here in this case, your illness may be very severe, a chronic illness, and you are buried in, then it is a must that you have your brothers, sisters, or nurses, or whoever, you know, you know, by your side to help you. So you need these three things when our, when we are physically extremely ill. So similarly, when we are mentally ill, and we are of course mentally ill, if anger is not illness, then what do you mean by illness? If hatred is not illness, then what, what, what is illness? So the very definition is illness, definition of illness is fulfilled by all these negative emotions, anger, jealousy, hatred, you know, and the worst kind of pandemic actually. This virus, you know, 
menacing virus pandemic which we are confronting right now, of course, is a pandemic, very bad, very destructive. But at least there is an injection and there are some, some kind of treatments, right? So it's quite hopeful now things will change. You know, in many countries, like things have really, really improved. But what about this pandemic inside us, the negative emotions, the hatred, the jealousy, the anger, which is not coming from any virus from outside. It's there with you inside. So how can you sleep with these negative emotions? <laughs> Seriously speaking, it's something like that, you know? And now if you think, because we are very clever, so if you think, okay, Buddha's teachings are wrong, you know, we are living in the modern advanced age, so anger is important, jealousy is important, go ahead, enjoy. But our common sense and our regular experience tells us clearly how destructive, damaging these negative emotions are all these killings, exploitations, discriminations, bullying, you know, which has happened on a regular daily basis in all the cities all over the world. Imagine how many, not millions, billions are suffering because of bully, discrimination, things like that. We, could, we don't keep a track of that. It is impossible to keep a track of that. It will be just astounding. So if you want long-lasting happiness, as we are all saying that I want long-lasting, if that is truly your goal, <laughs> there's no other shortcut. There's no shortcut. There's no injection. There's no push button enlightenment. The Buddha himself said, I've shown you the path to liberation. Liberation is up to you. So reducing the intensity of these negative emotions is the only way. Is the only way. So therefore we need to really form kind of groups and societies to teach these ways of dealing with the negative emotions. You don't need to call it a Buddhist teaching or things like that if you don't feel, you know, people don't like, sometimes people don't like different denomination, denominations. Okay. We need to form groups and help each other discourage this unchecked, rampant negative emotions spreading wild all over the world. And say no to negative emotions. And we need to learn to say enough is enough. The, the time you bullied me, I'm talking about negative emotions, okay? The time your negative emotions bullied me is a time gone. Because at that time I had no knowledge. I did not pay attention to the destructiveness of negative emotions. Now I got some sense of who you are. You opportunistic, you cunning, you stupid. Negative emotions. Now I will be alert. I will concentrate and guard you, watch you and banish you, kick you out. No more friendship. <laughs> that is the language we need to adopt. It's really important. That way we can gradually change the society, transform the society. And in fact, through that way, we can make this world much happier place to live. And I remember very clearly, His Holiness Dalai Lama once said that the nirvana that is talked about in Buddhism may be you know, uh, something that is difficult to achieve. But if we reduce the intensity of these this negative emotions, and, and cultivate more love, more compassion, and then we will achieve a kind of societal nirvana, societal liberation. I told this, shared this experience earlier, some of you may have heard. When I was many years back, when I was working in Tibet House in New Delhi, there's this Indian gentleman who asked me to you know, teach him Buddhism. So every evening we used to sit together and he would, I would teach a little bit, he would ask questions, things like that. So one day he said, since you have been studying Buddhism for a number of years and you're also a monk, you, you must be highly realized. 
<laughs> now I'm in trouble, okay? <laughs> so then I would, you know, then I said, I, I need to, I, I could not give an answer quickly because I don't have that kind of very visible, big, you know, quantum jump kind of re realization. So I had to think a little bit, then I answered him by saying, okay, when you ask me whether I have any realization, you are asking this question from the point of view whether I have the capacity to fly or make myself invisible or open a third eye, which Lobsang Rambak guy called Lobsang Rambak claimed. <laughs> so if you are asking these things, I have none. But in fact, in Buddhism, when we talk about realization, in Buddhism, it hardly talks about being able to fly. That's not, that, that is good, it's a great feat, but nothing so unique. Birds are flying all the time. Now even, you know, with human intelligence, aeroplanes are flying, you know, but that doesn't minimize human misery, human problem, <laughs> right? So, so real realization means, real attainment or accomplishment means when you reduce the intensity of your negative emotions. And I sometimes call it magic. We are so controlled. We are, we are so used to with negative emotions. It really looks like, you know, it's difficult for me to part away from this negative emotion. They are part of me kind of feeling. There is a, there is a book written by one of the Panchen Lamas of a dialogue and discussion. In fact, a debate between the self grasping, self-cherishing attitude and bodhicitta, the mind cherishing other beings. So the self-grasping has many points to defend self. You know, it's self-grasping by which I've been taking care of you, by which I've been taking care of my family, you know, things like that. So that is how we think, you see. Right? But then if you think calmly and properly, then you will find how destructive these negative emotions are. So therefore, in order to you know, remove these negative emotions, we need to follow a proper path taught by somebody who had gone through this path, removed all the negative emotions. And we call that person Buddha, one who is completely enlightened. Okay, I can hear, you can ask many questions. Okay, questions, there will be endless questions. How can we believe that somebody who knows everything? These are big questions, not easy to answer. But at least you, you don't need to, you know, overreach. You know, sometimes without knowing the basic thing and practicing the basic thing which makes sense, we are fond of asking big questions, you see. You have every liberty and freedom to ask those big questions, but it's really not very useful. It's really like trying to overreach things. You know, you remember this, the, the, the arrow incidents? Many of you heard it. You know, somebody shot an arrow to somebody from a distance. He was, he was got stuck with that arrow and bleeding. It's a very famous parable. And uh, so this, this the Buddha told this parable because one of his students, a monk, Malukya by name, one day, you know, early morning, he was in his meditation heart, but something came in his mind, thinking that, you know, Buddha has been very kind to me, he taught many things, but there are many things that he did not answer. So I need to go and ask him these questions. If he answers, then fine. If he doesn't answer or could not answer, then probably I'll choose the other path or things like that. So he, you know, in a, in a hurry, he goes to the Buddha and asks these questions. And Buddha, the first Buddha said, oh, I'm, I'm not looking for students. You want to leave, you leave kind of, you know, a kind of <laughs> little bit uh, blunt kind of answer. But then he give answered by giving, telling this parable that there is a person who has been shot by an arrow and he's struck by the arrow and he's bleeding. So now at that time, what should you do? What, 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 what should that person who is struck with this arrow and bleeding should do? 
immediately take medical treatment, take the arrow out and take medical necessary medical treatment or ask all the philosophical or questions related to this incidence of, uh, you know, this being shot by the arrow. So here in this case also, you can ask a lot of questions. Who must be that person who shot the arrow? How far that person is? How tall that guy is? Whether his arms have any muscles or not? Whether he has any mouse ridges on his face or not? You know, And what was the speed of the arrow? And what was the, the material by which the bow and the arrow is made of? You know, just in this case also, you can ask hundreds of questions. So if you refuse to take the needed medical treatment and you keep on asking this, these, these questions, much before you get answers, you will be a dead person. What, a, what an amazing answer. So therefore, the Buddha said, like that, you see, like that. You need to do those things which you can do right now and which you can see the benefit. For example, whether it's possible to become Buddha or Nirvana, you can ask, of course, you have every freedom, but the important thing is whether you can reduce your anger. Yes, of course. By seeing the uselessness and destructiveness, you know, the conflict, the division created by anger and so forth, the wrinkles that is brought on your face by when you get angry, things like that, you know, and the madness that comes in the mind through anger and so forth, you will see anger is a poison and you will be able to reduce it. That is the benefit. That is the way to enlightenment. And then as far as the question of uh, getting completely enlightened, what we know at least is there is no limit to the capacity of human mind. It can be developed to limitless quality. And then also there are many things which we are unable to see because of obstruction by these negative emotions. And as and when you reduce these negative emotions, the clarity will gain. The clarity will come and by which you are able to learn many things quickly. So possibility seems to be there. But the important thing is right at this stage, we can do many of these practices and become happier, holistic and more meaningful. That is the key. Okay, so don't don't just talk about big big things. And <laughs> for example, if you if you if you want to, you know, go for an excursion, and go to a beautiful place. The goal is to go to that beautiful place, but to go to this beautiful place, you should watch your step right from the, your door. Otherwise, you might trip, you know, trip and fall and hurt yourself. You see. So therefore, it is important uh, to have clear understanding. And now here, when we say Buddha, Buddha is somebody who is without any faults, who is endowed with all the positive qualities, uh, and who sees all sentient beings as equal without any discrimination. And one who knows everything. Therefore, I take refuge to him. Talk about Buddha for a while. You know, we, you must seek the friendship of somebody who is kind, who is compassionate, you see, to start with. Therefore, good friend, going with good friend, reliable friend is the first step. So therefore, Sangha. So Dharma basically means the path taught by the Buddha and the cessation, Nirvan that you achieve. These two are the Dharma, not the, not the text. Text is something like artificial dharma. And then also sangha, normally for the, for the monks we say sangha, but the ordinary monks are actually not sangha, which is within the three objects of refuge. The sangha within the three objects of refuge, for example, Buddha is a sangha. Or, or all those other practitioners, monk or layman or laywoman, doesn't matter, but so all those practitioners who have achieved the path of seeing, who have realized emptiness directly, those are Sangha, those are Sangha. So the ordinary monks are something like <laughs> artificial or imputed Sangha. 
Okay. So we need to know this. So now here in this case, in the Buddhist practice, the main reason why we take refuge to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha is we want to get out of this samsara, remove the ignorance and achieve liberation, nirvana. So therefore, as I mentioned earlier, when we talk about doing Buddhist practice, we are primarily talking about doing those practices which will lead you to achieve that state of liberation. That makes Buddhist practice unique. Yeah, they are in today's world. Well, there are many people who, who, who refrain from killing. Wonderful. Even, even not, not participating in doing the 10 you know, negative practices. There may be many, which is good, of course. But they are, they are not aiming that to achieve liberation. So there's a the difference. So here we take refuge with the Dharma Sangha to achieve liberation. So they are the, the object of refuge that can help us to achieve liberation. So therefore, as much as possible, in terms of your practice, you need to recite every day, if possible, many times, if not at least a few times. Just recite these this, this words. I take refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I become enlightened. Through my practice of giving and so forth, may I achieve Buddhahood for the sake of all seven beings. So in this way, you take refuge and also you take cultivate Bodhicitta. That must be there. And in fact, because of the power of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, just by regularly taking refuge, it is said to be the source of success for many of things that you, you do or you know, less illness, less sickness. So many benefits are being explained, provided if we have the wholehearted trust. Because from the side of the Buddha, he has, he has gained all the needed qualities to help you. He's ready to help you. He's like the sun. The sun never says, I will shine on this place, on that place, not on this place, not on that. Never makes a discrimination. But if you build your house in such a way that your doors and windows are improperly constructed, and then the rays of the sun, the light of the sun can never come. So it is your mistake, not the mistake of the sun. So similarly, from Buddha's side, everything is ready. From our side, we should have that receptivity. It's like the hook. It's like the hook and uh, hook and the ring. The hook is there, but you should have that ring, which is your faith. Okay. So, so therefore, but you need to read more about this. I, I can't spend so much time just explaining about this. So, so then luckily there are so many texts about the qualities of the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, things like that. Please read. So the, the six recollections that we are talking about here in this verse is actually an instruction that Nagarjuna gives for the benefit of both the, both the ordained monks and nuns and also lay people, a common practice. Okay, so for everybody taking refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Now he's giving this teaching to, to Buddhist origins, of course, in those days. Okay? So therefore, taking refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Okay? Now, if you take refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, then you need to see Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha as the ultimate liberator. You have to have that faith. Okay? But if, you, if your faith is like, you know, two-pointed, then the support will also not be there. Concentration, the importance of concentration, I explained earlier, it applies here also. So remember then, Sangha is important. For example, if you're traveling, even in ordinary parlance, if you're traveling somebody, you will go with somebody, a friend who is reliable, with whom you can enjoy, not somebody who will keep on fighting throughout the journey, you see. Right? So therefore, Sangha means, Sangha means, the Tibetan word Sangha is Gindun, which means somebody who is spiritually inclined. Right? 
So you need to go with somebody whose, whose thought is compassion and love and you know, wish to benefit others, who is like optimistic and who is not pessimistic, who is not discouraging, who is not complaining all the time. You know, some, you know go, go with those people because we are ordinary people. Friend makes a huge difference. It's very, very easy to be duped by clever, you know, cunning people, you see. Okay, so Sangha is important in that sense. And then the fourth recollection is practice of giving. Practice of giving is out of the practice of the six perfections. Practice of giving is specially recommended to the lay people. In the case of the monks, the practice of Dharma teaching is more encouraged. Of course, all of us, if possible, do the practice of giving, you know, education or Dharma, rather than just giving wealth and food. And I was noticing during this pandemic also, there are many, many kind-hearted kind -hearted people who come out in the street and gives money and gives food. These are amazing. Really, we should rejoice, but these are temporary solutions. The society needs a long-term solution. Right from such, right from you know, experiencing such mishaps, we should be a society of compassionate people, you know, who had a long time before thinking about how to solve the problems when it comes. You see. All these preparations cannot be done in day. Like for example, during this pandemic, many people are suffering having no medicine, no hospital, meaning that these are because of lack of compassion, these things are not prepared. Whereas it is clear, crystal clear to everybody, one or the other form of problems, physical illnesses will come. So hospitals and medicines and doctors, this should be there everywhere. So instead of abundance of such facilities, even the few which is far and uh, scattered, they're also doing business, you see. <laughs> of course, they have a right to you know, get enough money for their labor, but to, to just take advantage of the bad situation and make more money, many are doing like that, which is unfortunate. So, so we need to, human beings need to find that long-term solution by changing one's mental attitude. That's, that's the most important thing. So um, practice of giving of food, of material things, of Dharma teaching, of protecting others' life. There are so many different forms of giving and especially giving those things which will, which will cure illness, which will benefit others. So giving does not mean that you give everything. Giving does not mean that you give poison. Giving does not mean that you give arms and weapons. So normally we should give, you know, I, I try to, you know, when I, I'm not a good, you know, giver, but <laughs> my, my hands are tight fisted, okay? So don't expect anything to, get from me. But sometimes when I'm in good mood, what I, <laughs> what I give is torch. Torch. That might save the life of a person. You know, torch is to be used when people move in darkness. Or nice books, pens, you know, things for health. Those must be given. Not like knife or sword or guns and poisons and then, then those things which will, you know, uh, uh, activate attachment, anger, jealousy, things like that. So giving is very important practice. But one of the Tibetan teacher, he, he, he said that I'm, I'm not going to make much praise about the benefit of giving, but I will talk about the, you know, badness of holding. You see? So this is an important point that I want to talk. Now you go back to your room and check how much 
you have accumulated over the years, the holdings that you have done. And I told you honestly, you know, whatever holdings I have, these days I'm slowly, slowly, you know, because of aging, I'm trying to at least give away many of the things that I have hoarded over the years. Because many of them, because of our stinginess, because of our grasping, clinging, we just give it. And I find many things which I've kept for so many years with me and never used. They're getting moldy, dusty, on and off, I have to clean it, and then it put it again in the Almira or something. What, what is the fun? An unnecessary headache. Believe me, at least we can start doing this practice. Give away those things which you don't, really don't need. Okay, you are not Miller, I'm not Miller, but we cannot give up everything tonight, and which, which will also not be visible. But, but think carefully and give those things which you really don't need. And I, I promise that your, 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 your house will be, your room will be cleaner and simpler and you will be happier. Practice it. And don't, don't buy too many things which is unnecessary. Don't just go run after advertisement. This is, you need this, you need this, you need that, you know. So many advertisements and all the time asking you to update your utensils, update, update your microwave oven, update your fridge, update your mobile phone. You know, I told you this many times that the problem is the guy himself or herself never updated for so many years. And we keep on updating the external things. <laughs> There's the joke, really. There's the joke. So therefore, I'm, I'm saying this. I'm not talking about big realizations and big experiences, which I don't have. But the small mountain activities experience that I have, I'm sharing. And I'm sure you will agree with me. The only thing is you need to practice that. Life will be simpler, easier. And in case if you have to move to some, somewhere, you can easily move because you don't have many things. Like that. Okay. So giving, giving, giving good advice and giving many things you can do. And then morality, ethical discipline, which basically means not harming others not harming others. I have, from the Tibetan word, loosely translated this word morality as proper way of life. Morality means proper way of life. Proper way of a life is a life where you do not harm others, where you do not take advantage of others, where you do not cheat others. That's proper way of life. And what is proper, improper? Just think about yourself, take yourself as an example. How would you like to be treated by others and things like that, okay? So that's morality. And then the sixth is recollection of celestial beings. Celestial beings or gods are also in the samsara. So why should we remember that? We might ask this question, but here we are thinking about the, the celestial beings. They also have very special qualities of concentration and things like that, which, which is achieved through many positive practices like wisdom, concentration, so forth. So just like what has attained by these celestial beings, I should also practice those causes which leads to such an, such an achievement. So there's the meaning of recollection of celestial beings or gods. And especially if you enter into tantric practice, then visualizing the deities is a very important practice. So there the deity is again, a higher kind of, you know, of being, okay? Tantric deities, when we talk about tantric deities. So these are the six recollections. So we need to, uh, to start with, we need to start doing those practices. Okay, I'm sorry, time just, just 
flies, I managed to miss just one word. Anyways, don't, don't worry. Sometimes I will be galloping. Sometimes I will be trotting. <laughs> okay, ask one or two questions, then, we, then we'll stop. So thank you so much, Kishlatuji Chen. Now, now some questions, please. And I'll give preference to those who raise their hands and ask questions themselves. I'm so sorry. I do believe in justice. Mm. <laughs> so please raise your hands and let me spot you. Ah, Jackie. Jackie, you can go ahead. I've sent you an unmute request. Hello, thank you um, for teaching. I wondered if you could go into more of how we are under bondage of the aggregate. Bondage of the aggregate means like... The, 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 the physical, psychophysical aggregate, as I said, when we talk about aggregate, it's both the body and the mind. Mind, of course, is under bondage because it's predominantly controlled by negative emotions. Now the body also is predominantly controlled by your mind to, to a great extent. And the, the body itself is like prone to sickness, prone to aging. And if you sit for a meditation, your knees start hurting, your back starts hurting, you feel sleepy. <laughs> So there, your, your, your body in that sense is not very functionable, not very serviceable, right? And then because of this body, you do, how, how, how hard you have to work to feed yourself, to clothe yourself. We all run hither and thither. This business, that business, you know, work almost like a donkey. I'm not using a good word, but right? just for this body. So, so the, the, the point is that if you simply just, just, just become a slave to this body, there's not much meaning. The Elpur Shanti Deva says, me tulatin, me tulatin in it, dunge chubu chileto, twinti chi su nye barka mongo ju su nye malo. That means this human body is like a boat to cross the ocean. So in that sense, it is useful if you use it to cross the ocean of samsara. So in that sense, such a precious human life is difficult to find with, with such wonderful intelligence. So if you use it, then it's wonderful. You can cross the ocean of samsara. So therefore, Shanti Deva says that you stupid, this is not, not the time to sleep. <laughs> that means wake up. Realize this, this amazing potential that you have. So if you use it, it's precious human life. Use it in the right way. But if you let it just to, you know, meaningless activities, then you're wasting the precious human life. Okay. I probably, I told you earlier, now I don't remember the details. I was once reading a book where somebody, a clever scientist, he, he tried to find out how much dollars this human body will cost. So in terms of the body itself, it will cost few few thousands. Not much, because most of the stuffs are, you know, you can buy in the market. The chemicals, you know, many of these things you can buy in the market. But still you cannot make, just from this material products, you cannot create a human being because of this thing called mind, okay? The scientists are also, until now, they are not able to create human beings. They're talking about cloning and all those things, but I don't think they are successful in creating a genuine human being. Okay, duplicate human being, yes, you can make. We are very good in making duplicates, but there's not human being, proper human being. A proper human being, we cannot create, okay? Lasso. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Kishila. We have uh, another person, Rugare. You can go ahead. And I'm sending you a mute request. Yeah. Great. Thank you, everyone. Hello, Kishila. Thank you for the teaching. So the question is, knowing that ignorance is the root of samsara, but needing to, you know, 
get good teaching from good teachers? How does one do that with good discernment to find real teachers and real Sangha that's healthy? Take time. Listen to read books, listen to teacher. Take time, no need to rush. Okay, don't 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 make a romantic relationship with any teacher. Okay. So sometimes people get so fascinated, oh, he's such a good teacher, oh, he's an amazing teacher, you know. And then you just run after the teacher. Then after a while, you see some faults and shortcomings, and say, oh, I was cheated, you know. So don't do that. One of the Tibetan teachers, he says that even when you go into the marketplace to buy horse, you need to check the teeth of the horse and you know other parts of the body too carefully. <laughs> so, so if this is the case, then why why should not you choose your teacher carefully? Okay, you can you carefully, and then most important thing is use your common sense. How far this sounds beneficial to you? Okay, then practice it, and then you gradually you will find you if you if you you you, you will not meet a Buddha. Okay, you'll find ordinary teachers. But among the ordinary teachers, rely on those teachers who are, who are less selfish, if not completely selfless, but less selfish, who are more compassionate, who are not running after money, who are not running after name and fame. Okay, so teachers who run after money, who run after name and fame, there's a very negative sign. Because the real great teachers, they say, you won't get name and fame and money by running after it. Just by doing your job, whether it's a teacher or any, any ordinary person. And this I have seen very clearly. If you really want name and fame and money, do your job properly, it will come. It will come, you see. So without such realization, people just run after name and fame and then take advantage of others and tell lies, you know, then, then then don't don't follow those people. You have every right not to follow them. And then also maintain some distance between your teacher and yourself with your friends also. Yes, mentally you may feel very close, but maintain always maintain some distance. It will be safer. <laughs> I always give you the example of how, how to make a relationship with fire. If you go too close, the fire will burn you. If you stay too away from the fire, you will not get the warmth. Okay, so the distance should be such that it's not too far away, not too close. So therefore the distance learning online, online teaching is very good. <laughs> All right. Lasu Gishla, we have two uh, questions from our Russian friends. Okay. Yeah. Gishla, uh, th thank you very much. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, and the first one actually is very similar to the question of Jackie, I think. Uh, Marina is asking, uh, uh, I've lived I, I, many lives before, and I imagine that in one of my lives, I was uh, an aunt or a maggot, even maggot like yeah. uh, or or you know any insect so but how come uh i got uh, this uh, human yeah, yeah. Uh, birth yeah. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. uh what can this insect uh, does it mean that insects maggots they have uh, consciousness because uh, they are born humans and yeah. then how can they collect right karma to become no no the, the the one one is that that you thought in one of your lifetimes you are maggot it's your imagination not necessarily so <laughs> okay so you don't have to trust that that much it's your thinking you know so not necessarily true and then of course uh, in our many lifetimes we have accumulated many karmas, actions. Some actions responsible for getting life of human being, some actions responsible for being born as a maggot or any other insect, you know? So, so you, can be, you can be born in any of this and with the change of life, depending upon which one of these actions is more powerful, you get different, different rebirths. So therefore, sometimes you are born as human being, sometimes you are born as a, an animal, sometimes it's a bird, insect, and things like that. 
So therefore, we are saying that today you born this, got this human life. Now you need to make this effort to be continuously born, not only as a human being, but become better and better. So that, that there is a kind of urgency here. You can clearly see because next time, you know, unless you are able to accumulate powerful karma to continuously get good rebirth, then next time it is not sure where you will be born. Right? Okay. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the next question is, you mentioned about uh, the preciousness of giving and uh, Irina and Oleg uh, is asking um, if, uh, you know, there, there is a person uh, who uh, always says no when I ask for help. And then mm. this person comes to me and asks for help. Mm. And my immediate reaction is to say no, because I feel offensed, right? And uh, even if I uh, overcome this feeling, uh, I'm not sincere in my helping to this person how to deal with this situation. Yeah, but when we practice, you know, it is not revenging anybody, okay? Because somebody had not helped you, therefore you refuse to help. There is a kind of revenging. So, so that, that, that should not be there. And then otherwise, in, in terms of practice of giving also, it is never said in the Buddhist text that, that you give whatever you have or you give any, any time to anybody, not like that. There is a clear explanation about what to give, to whom to give, when to give, things like that. For example, if, if a monk is like not eating after lunch, then it's not proper to give you know, dinner to that monk. Okay, things like that, things like that. So if, if, if a poison is really, really useful, helpful, then you can give it. Even medicine is discouraged to be given to someone who is not going to be benefited by that medicine. You know? So therefore you need to use your based on intelligence, what to give, when to give, how to give and so forth. Gishela, I would like to clarify a little bit. Uh, uh, maybe I lost this little detail. And if if I help, I, I still help this person who refuses to help me, but I do it reluctantly, like remembering this uh, offense. Uh, will it be the proper way of helping? It's not a proper way, but it is better than not helping. Because because in in, in the in the beginning, all of us have this reluctance to do any kind of practice. Just don't get surprised, okay? But at least with reluctance, you have started giving. And next time it will be more forthcoming. See, this is how we get habituated with good things. Thank you. Isha, this one last question may at least post that okay, in sure, the sure. chat box. So we have Sharmila uh, requesting your advice on how to control anger. And uh, Sharmila states that it arises when you least expect it, and it's very difficult. Difficult, yes, you said difficult, but you never said impossible. So there's the good thing. Difficult, everything is difficult. Earning food is difficult. Getting a job is difficult. There's so many you know, difficult things. Because it is difficult, we never give up. Don't, don't give up. And then the more, important, the more importantly, you should do a research. Okay. The advantages of anger, disadvantages of anger, write down one, two, three, four, five in each side, write down. This is what I've been telling people many times. Don't just listen to the teaching or listen to the teacher, but based on your own common sense, because as you clearly mentioned that you, you easily get angry. So you have that experience. So how many times you got angry and all those times when you were angry, what, what did you do? You know, what kind of sin you created? What kind of benefit you got? What kind of disturbance you got? Honestly, sincerely write down all this, right? And then you will, you will find that so many, so many, disadvantages of getting angry. I said this many times. You get ugly, first of all. Most of us don't want to become ugly. That's why we wash our face and put cosmetics and things like that. So if you want to get ugly, go on. Nobody wants to get crazy. 
as you rightly mentioned, you get crazy, okay? But then to, to, to answer your question more precisely, that yes, despite our during you know, calm times, despite our being able to see the drawbacks of anger, but then when we encounter a particular situation, we immediately flare up, that happens to everybody. Not, not something you know, unique and a uh, unique problem to you. It happens to everybody because we, have, we are used to it, negative emotions for so many lives, so many years. Okay, then after that, you need to see. The, the good thing is, there's nobody who says, I'm angry 24 hours. Because that person who is normally very hot tempered and angry, he also needs his time to talk to some friends, you know, eat, eat his lunch and dinner, <laughs> take a nap, things like that, you know. So nobody remains angry 24 hours. That means anger is not fundamental part of your mind. So we can reduce it. But many people start thinking that if I give up my anger, people will bully me. Then there will be no strength left in me to respond to them. That's how people think. That's wrong. Without anger, you can develop a force, a strength, which is much, much more forceful than anger. Anger is blind. Anger is blind. Yes, when you get angry, you get an extra energy but that, that extra energy is essentially blind. So it is completely unsure whether it will hit the target or not. But when you develop this strength with calmness, with nonviolence, without anger, then that has wisdom, that has eye, that has insight, and will be able to deal effectively the problems and say things which should be said and will not say things which is not, not needed. But when we get angry, we, we say all the nasty things from the mouth because our sense of judgment is lost to them. So in this way, you need to think the many drawbacks and disadvantages of anger and the benefits of having no anger. Okay. That's all, Gishla. We are truly very grateful, Gishla. And we will try to do as advised. Um, yeah. When we look forward to seeing you next week, yeah. uh, we will end the session with our uh, Avalokita Shwara Mantra, uh, mm -hmm. led by Gishu. Okay. Oh money pay me hong, 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 Oh money be me, 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 Thank you.